So we're going to finish up chapter four today, which is on radical functions. Okay, there's some examples. Okay, anytime you have an expression that has a root in it, that's a radical expression. So the first one says y equals square root of x minus 2. Um, the next one, y equals cube root of x squared minus 1 plus x. Okay, anytime you see a root, that makes it a radical function. So in general, when you write a radical, there's, there's two parts to it. Okay, there's this number that's on the outside, which I'm calling n. There's a name for that we'll mention in a second. Okay, but n basically tells you what kind of root it is. Is it a square root? Is it a cube root? Um, could be any kind of root. But it does have to be positive, and it has to be an integer. There's no such thing as like a 1.7th root. Okay, we're not going to. We won't be doing that. Okay, so any expression of that form is called a radical. The number n, okay, that'll always be an integer that's positive. That's called your index. And then the thing that's under the root, a, that's called the radicand. So in the examples up above, x minus 2 is a radicand. x squared minus 1 is a radicand as well. The actual symbol that you draw, that's just called your radical sign. <coughs> okay, any questions on those, those words? Radical, radicand, index. So if you don't have an index, okay, we always assume that it's a 2. So that's how I knew when I wrote my first example. It says y equals its square root, x minus 2. Okay, we can also take something that's written as a radical and rewrite it using an exponent. Does anybody know what exponent is equivalent to square root? Like if I could take the square root of 4, you know, I'll get 2. Or if I take 4 and raise it to this power, it will also take the square root of it. But there's, a, there's a power you can use. Maria? It would be to the one half power. Yeah, to the one half power. Okay, so here's an example. If you take the square root of 16, okay, you get 4. If you take 16 and raise it <coughs> to the 1 half power, you get 4. How about a cube root? Any thought what power that's equivalent to? Taylor? One third. Yeah, 1 third power. And likewise, a fifth root is 1 fifth power. But what would happen here? Instead of writing it you know, like this, x to the fourth and then taking the fifth root. It's like x to the fourth to the one-fifth. What can you do with x to the fourth to the one-fifth? That can be simplified. Let's see how you simplify it. Yep. Yeah, you'd multiply your exponents and what would you get? Yep, and 0.8, what would that be as a fraction? Four fifths. Four fifths, yeah. So you take four times one fifth, it's four fifths. All right, so that's why sometimes we'll write, them, we'll write our radicals using exponents because it allows us to simplify by using the power to a power property. Any questions on those? So in general, to solve uh, an equation for the principal nth root, okay, principal nth root means we're just looking for one answer. Okay, a lot of times if you write just the square root symbol, when you're solving an equation, you get two answers. Well, principal root means you just want one answer. 
So if it's an odd root, Q root, fifth root, okay, in fact, I think in the homework we did a Q root for one of the, one of the problems. So if it's odd, basically you're just solving this equation. So if we had something like this, I think, in the homework. It was x cubed equals negative 5. All we have to do is take the cube root of each side. Okay, if it was something like, let's say, x to the seventh equals 12, you take the seventh root of each side. Okay, just to make sure people know how to type that in, if you want the seventh root of 12, you type in a 7. When you go to math, go to the fifth option, and it automatically puts the 7 as your index. And you type in 12, and it's 1.42. Or 1.43. Right? So if you multiply 1.43 times itself seven times, you'll get about 12. It's because we round it off. You might be a little off. Okay, it's a little different if n is even. So if you're finding a square root or a fourth root, tenth root, something like that. First of all, the number on the right-hand side has to be positive. Okay, you can't solve a problem like this using real numbers. Okay. So A will always be positive okay, if it's a problem that we're going to try to graph or, or solve. Especially graph, because we can't graph it if it's imaginary. Okay, and then the second part you're looking for a non-negative answer. Okay. Non-negative. If I want both answers, like to, let's say we had x squared equals 9. If I want you to solve this and I want both answers, I'll write down, make sure you give me both the positive and the negative answer. But if it just says find the principal root, that's just the positive one, not the negative one. All right, so now I want to look at what happens when we take a square root. I want to see, if, when you take the square root of a number, does it get smaller or does it get larger? Okay, what, do you, what do you think? It's smaller? Yeah? Smaller. Smaller? All right, let's see what happens. Um, what's the square root of 4, just the principal root? Yep. 2. 2. Okay, it definitely got smaller. Okay, square root of 18, that one doesn't come out nice. Uh, it's about 4.24. Did it get smaller? Yep, it got smaller. What's the square root of 1? One. 1. Did that get smaller? Is, so 1 is smaller than 1? No, it stayed the same, so it didn't get smaller. How about the square root of 1 half? If you try it, yeah? Point seven, um, point seven one. Yeah, if you take the square root of a half, you get 0 0.71. Smaller or larger? It got larger. Let's try another decimal. Let's try 0 0.2. I took the square root, it got larger. 0.45. So the answer, does it get smaller or larger? It depends. What do you think? is going to determine here whether you take a square root and it gets larger or it gets smaller or it stays the same. It kind of can break it up into three categories. Yep. Um, if it's bigger than one, then yeah. the square root be smaller. Yep. If the radicand is bigger than one, then what ends up happening with at least a square root is it gets smaller. If the radicand is less than one, like 0.5 or 0.2, what happens when you do a square root? It gets larger. All right, so there's different behavior whether it's less than one or more than one. And of course, it'll never be negative because um, we couldn't take the square root of a negative. So let's graph some of these roots. I want to graph square root, fourth root, and sixth root. Okay, 
And I think it'll be particularly helpful on here because you're gonna be able to see the different colors. Um, these lines are gonna be very close together. Second square root. I'll do my fourth root. And sixth root. Just doing a couple. We could do eighth root, tenth root. You'd see exactly what I'm about to show you. Oops. Six. On your calculator, it might not make the number small. It might just leave it as a big number in front of the um, root. That, that's okay. This calculator is just making it look nicer on the screen. Okay, let's graph all three and start in a standard window. So there's our square root, there's our fourth root, there's our sixth root. Okay, so I think it's, it's pretty clear that the square root, okay, if I trace, let's go over to the blue. Blue is my square root. That's the highest value, at least when you're after one. Okay, square root gives you the biggest number. If you take a fourth root, okay, it gets a little smaller. Okay, compare the same x values, about 5.6. The square root of 5.6 is about 2.36. The fourth root is 1.53. And the sixth root is 1.33. So the blue one's on top, then the red one, then the black one. Okay, everybody kind of see that? Now, between negative or between zero and one, something's happening there. Let's try to zoom in kind of over in that area and see if blue is always on top, red is always in the middle, and black is always on the bottom. So I'm gonna set my I'm gonna set my y max to three and my x max to two. So I'm really gonna zoom in right there. X max to two. Set your x min to zero. Set our y min to zero and y max to three. So there's the blue. There's the red and the black. So after one, we can see that pattern we were just talking about: blue on top, red in the middle, black on the bottom. What happens when you go before one, though? So when you're before one, or the, I'm sorry, the, larger, the, larger your square root. the larger your root. Yeah. So if you look at a square root, okay, square root ends up being the smallest when you're between zero and one. Fourth root ends up being in the middle, okay, just like it was before, and your sixth root ends up being the largest. Okay. So once we cross the point one one kind of the black line and the blue line switch places, okay? So there's different behavior whether you're before one or after one. So let's kind of summarize some of that. A point that all the graphs go through, they all go through the point zero, zero, and they all go through the point one, one. How can we check that? We can look at the table, okay, real quick. Type in, I already have it, zero. When x is zero, y is zero on all three graphs. <coughs> zero, zero is a point on every one of them. Type in one, square root of one is one, fourth root of one is one, sixth root of one is one. So any graph that has an even index will always go through the point zero, zero, and one, one. Now that's assuming that you don't transform it. We can shift it, left, right, up, down, all that stuff. If we shift it, Say we shift it up, well, it's not going to go through 0, 0 anymore. It's going to go through the point that's above 0, 0 if you shift up 1. Same thing with the point 1, 1. Okay, so these points can shift. Um, the domain. Okay, the domain, if you look at it, it goes from 0, okay, and you can include 0, all the way to infinity. It just keeps going. How about the range? What's the lowest, lowest y value that we ever hit in this picture? Yeah? Zero. 
Yep, zero. And what about the highest? Infinity. They're not going up very quickly, but they will, all these lines will continue to go up very slowly um, as you go to the right. So your domain and range are the same. And summarizing that behavior that we just had, when you're between 0 and 1, square root is the smallest. It's less than the fourth root. And the fourth root is less than the sixth root. So square root's on the bottom. Fourth root was in the middle. Sixth root was the biggest. That order switches when we go beyond 1. In that case, the square root was the one on top. Then the fourth root was a little smaller, and the sixth root even smaller. So this is the general behavior for all roots with even indices. Okay, any question on that behavior? Okay. Let's look at odd. Okay, I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to graph as many, but let's just graph the third root, if we can change it, and fifth root. And we're going to look at the same questions. Does it get smaller? Does it get bigger? Let's start with our standard window. Well, first thing to notice is it looks like this graph goes in both directions. It doesn't just go in one direction forever. Let's look at the table. 0, 0 is a point that's common on both of these graphs. So is 1, 1. So is negative 1, negative 1. So odd roots have three points that they always go through. 1, 1, 0, 0, negative 1, negative 1. So the behavior is going to switch. It's going to do something between negative infinity and negative 1. It's going to switch between negative 1 and 0. It's going to switch again between 0 and 1. And then it's going to have another behavior from 1 to infinity. So there's a lot of kind of these graphs crossing each other. All right, let's, um, let's zoom in. Let's try to go from, let's do negative 2 to 2 on the x. That should capture all the behavior that we need to see. And let's go from, Let's try negative 3 to 3 on the y. See if this is good enough. All right, and you know what? I'm even going to zoom in just a little more on the y. Go negative 2 to 2. I don't think you have to, but I think it'll show the curve better. It's pretty good. So let's, let's take this picture here. All right, so when we are less than negative 1, okay, we can see that the black line was on top. Okay, and what did the black line represent? Let's just go look at it. That was our fifth root. So when we're less than negative 1, the fifth root is on top. Okay. Then in, in this area, the fifth root goes underneath. Okay. The black line is underneath the red one, between negative 1 and 0. Then at 0, they switch places again. The black line is back on top, between 0 and 1. And then at 1, they switch places again, and the black line goes back underneath forever. Everyone see the behavior and how it's switching three times there? Mm -hmm. OK. So we'll, let's kind of just summarize that. So we already said that. Okay. Those three points are common to all roots with odd indices, unless you shift the graph or transform it. Okay. Domain and range. These graphs go up and down forever. Okay, so that's your range. They're never going to stop going up and down. They're never going to stop going left and right. Okay. 
So there's two times where the cube root was smaller than the fifth root, right? or in our case, where the red line was under the black line. If you go less than negative 1, and if you go between 0 and 1, the red line is under the black line. And then there's two times where the cube root is above the fifth root. That'll happen between negative 1 and 0. Your red line is above the black one. And it will happen between 1 and infinity. Okay, so I'm not going to ask you to explain that on a test. I just want you to understand that the cube roots are a little more complex and they switch, they kind of switch places a little bit more than the even roots. So we've, we've kind of seen the, the general pictures of what odd roots look like. Odd roots always have this kind of sideways S shape to them. Even roots always look something like that. Okay, always. Now you can stretch it or shift it, but again, those are the general shapes. Okay, any questions on those, those facts? All right, so now let's take a look at our, our transformations. Okay, everything that we've already learned about transformations works exactly the same with roots. They all work the same. So up at the top, I put a root, and I put in four variables showing all four transformations. Okay. A would be a horizontal shift. B would be a horizontal um, stretch or compression. I'm just going to write stretch, but it also could be a compression. Stretching can be either way. Um, C would be your vertical stretch or compression. And D, that would be a vertical shift. Now, don't forget that B could also cause a reflection, and so could C. Let me show you what, um, what it would look like if you put in a negative in front of the square root. Let's look at that. Or a negative in front of any root. Okay, but I'll just do a square root. So here's the square root of x. Here's negative square root of x. What this is going to do is it's going to reflect it over one of the axes. In this case, over the x. Okay, so your vertical stretch reflects over the x, or your, where the vertical stretch is, c. If it's negative, it reflects over the x. What if you put the negative inside the root? What would that do? Yeah? Would it reflect it over the y? That's gonna yeah, it's gonna reflect over the y. And then if you want it to reflect over the x and the y, you put a negative in both spots. Okay, so the transformations that we're doing here, it's exactly the same as the ones we've done for parabolas, um, rational functions. There's no difference. And you do have to remember that What's under the root works the opposite of what you would think. Horizontal shifting is opposite. Horizontal stretching is also opposite. Okay, so how would you get the graph of g of x if you started out with square root of x as the parent function or, or the basic graph? What would you do to square root of x to change it into g of x. Oh, Brian? Just subtract 
So what's going what's gonna to happen? Is it going to stretch? Is it going to shift up or down, left or right? It's going to shift to uh, horizontally. Yep, which way? Well, be careful because phase shift goes the opposite way that we would think. Oh, not phase shift, horizontal shift. It's going to shift two to the right. When we talk about trig functions, we call a horizontal shift a phase shift. So that's why I mentioned that. Yeah, but if you're not sure, you could always just check it. <coughs> Try putting in a minus two. And it shifts it two to the right. So shift two right. How about h of x? Yeah, go ahead. Shift left three. Yep. Shift left three. And what would we want to do with k of x? Before we, before we even look at it, we, we might want to rewrite it a little bit. So it's more in the standard way that I wrote it up above. Yep. So you could write the square root of negative x plus 3, and um, it would, because you're putting a negative 1 in front of the x, it would reflect it over the x-axis. Right? It would reflect it when the negative is inside, oh, that's going to reflect it. So it would reflect it over the y-axis. Right. Yeah, it's going to reflect it over the y-axis, but that's going to be the second thing we do. The first thing we would do is we do that shift. Yep. Yep. This is going to be a left three. So it still is a plus three, so that's a left three. And you can verify if you want, just graph negative x plus three. Or you can even graph the original. The calculator will be fine with that. We just rewrote it so that it looks more like the standard form I had up above. Okay, and I wrote those letters in the order that you do them. Horizontal shifts, then your stretching, then your vertical stretch, then your vertical shift. A, B, C, D. Okay, so now we'll try um, two sketches and then that'll finish up graphing and we'll try solving um, a couple equations, some more algebra stuff. Okay, whenever you sketch a radical function, always include the point that corresponds to 0, 0, okay, if you're doing an even root. If you're doing an even root, the 0, 0, that's the start point. Okay, that's where your graph is going to start from and go to. So you always want to kind of get that start point. Um, if you're doing an odd function, 0, 0 is going to be the center of the S shape. So if you had an odd function, it would be the center of that S shape. So it's an important point, whether you're doing even or odd roots. Okay, to get the x value, just keep in mind, 0, 0 is going to shift now. It could move to a different spot. So to find where the x value is going to go to, just set the radicand equal to 0. So whatever's under the root, set that equal to 0. And that'll give you the x value of, of either your center point or your starting point. To find the y value, well, you're going to have a function, y equals. If you have an x value, you can just plug that into the function, do the arithmetic, and then you can get the y value. So you just substitute x in, and then you can find y. Generally, you want to include points to the left and to the right. If, if it's uh, applicable, for an even root, you won't be doing points on both sides. Even roots only go in one direction. Odd roots go in both. So we might want to check some extra points around the curve to kind of get the curvature. And then maybe check a point way out here and way out there. Okay, but these aren't as bad to sketch as the um, ones with asymptotes and, and that. Okay, so we don't have to, we don't have to get that fancy. Okay, so let's sketch this one. Two times the cube root of three minus two x plus one. 
Now, one way to think about it is in terms of transformations. Okay, you're going to be shifting it. It's going to be a plus 3. So that would shift it left 3. It's going to do a horizontal compression by a factor of 2. Then it's going to reflect. It's going to do a vertical stretch. And it's going to go up 1. Um, I think it's too confusing, so I'm just going to plot points and, and do it that way. Okay, let's find out where 0, 0 went to. So set the radicand equal to 0. And solve it. The reason that we don't have to worry about the two numbers on the outside, the 2 is a vertical. That affects y values. The 1 is a vertical shift. That affects y values. The only two numbers that affect horizontal stuff is under the radicand. So that's why you don't, that's all you need to find the x value. Let's right, solve that. Divide each side by negative 2. And we get x equals positive 3 halves. Okay, now let's find the y value. Plug that point back in and see what we get. So we're going to do 2 times the cube root, or 2 times, yeah, cube root of 3 minus 2 times fill in x. 3 halves, and the plus 1 is on the outside. Well, we already know what all this is going to come out to under the root. I got the number 3 halves because I set the radicand equal to what? 0. So I already know when I do 3 minus 2 times 3 halves, I'm going to get 0. That's why I picked 3 halves. So we're going to get the cube root of 0. What's the cube root of 0? 0 times 2? Still 0. And 0 plus 1? One. 1. Okay. So we get the point 3 halves, comma, 1. That's one point on this graph. As you set it equal to 0, would that be your center? That's going to be, since we're doing a cube root, yes, that's going to be the center of the S shape. Yep. Now to get the curvature, what I'm going to do is find, I need a few more points. Um, let me get a graph. Okay. Let's graph the point 3 halves, so 1.5 comma 1. Now I can do this two ways. I can either just take my equation, try some values, figure, figure it out by hand, or type it into the calculator and use the table. Uh, I'm going to use the table. So we have 2 times the cube root, whoops, not quite like that. All right, so. That looks like 2 cubed to me, but I don't think it's going to do that because the 3 is the index and the root, just the way it looks on there. If you want to be really sure, you could always just go like this. Put in a time symbol, but I think it was okay. So 2 times the cube root of 3 minus 2x plus 1. Okay, we can confirm our original point if we want to check it. 1.5 comma 1. Yep, that one's good. Okay, let's check, um, let's check a point that's pretty far out from there. Let's go all the way to the right on this graph. Let's go out to 10. Okay, we're at negative 4.1. So we're at 10, about negative 4.1. When I'm at, let's go the other way, negative 10. I'm at 6 point, about 6.7. Okay, I'm not really quite seeing the S shape yet, so I'm going to find a few more points around that, around that center, and it's probably going to show me the S shape better. Let's try 0. It's about 3.8. Okay, now I'm kind of starting to see it. Let's try... We got negative 1.9. 
Now I can, I can see the S shape better. If you need some more points, you could do a few more. But here's your basic graph. Let's graph and see how we did. A little gap there, that's just because the calculator's thinking there's like an asymptote, but it's, it's having a little trouble with that. Um, but that is a connected graph, it's, it's fine. Okay. Any questions on that? So that's the general shape of an odd root. Always has that S shape. Okay, let's try a, an even root. Set your radic hand equal to zero. This time, when I find this point, is it going to be a center point or is it a starting point <coughs> that the graph goes from? Think about the shape of a fourth root. Yeah? It's going to end up being a starting point. Yeah, it's going to be a starting point. And it depends if we've reflected it, whether it's going to go this way or the other way. Negative 3x equals negative 4. And x equals 4 thirds. Once I get x, how do I get y? Plug in the yep, plug x in. So 3 times the fourth root of 4 minus 3 times 4 thirds minus 2. What do I already know with the radicand is going to equal? 0. I picked a value that forces that to happen. What's the fourth root of zero? Times three? Zero minus two? Negative two. So our starting point for this root is four thirds comma negative two. Okay, so we get our graph. Let's um, Graph four thirds, so that's about uh, one point three. So one point three, negative two. And the big thing is, is it going to go to the right or is it going to go to the left? Well, you can kind of look at the transformations and see that there is a negative in front of x. So this one probably going to end up going the other way. You'll know if you're wrong because you're going to get errors. If you pick x's on the wrong side of 4 thirds, you'll get an error. Okay, so let's type it in. 3 times the 4th root of 4 minus 3x minus 2. Okay. Let's because of that negative, I'm, I'm already thinking that it's going to go to the left. So we have to plug in x's smaller than 4 thirds. Let's try an x bigger than 4 thirds. Error. The graph doesn't go in that direction. Okay? The, the x's go towards the left. So let's try 0. Get about 2.2. Uh, you know, let's even try 1. Because this graph looks like it's curving up pretty sharply. coming up pretty quick, and now let's get some x values that are farther away, like negative 10. 5.2. I can pretty much see the curve here. It's kind of like that. Okay, there's your, now the graph isn't showing it here. And the reason it's not showing it is because it's getting too steep in this section for it to show. But watch what happens if I zoom in. See how it doesn't go below the x-axis right now? I bet if I zoom in right there, it will. See how it goes below now? But it's still it's not showing the whole thing. It's too steep for the calculator to show. So you just have to know it starts at that point, doing the algebra. Okay, so there, there's an even root. And last thing we'll look at is how you solve a radical equation. Okay, it's possible you could have done this in um, algebra one, maybe algebra two. 
But the goal is you have to isolate a radical on one side. And then you're going to raise each side of that equation to the index. So for example, if you had a square root and you want to cancel it out, you're going to square. If you had a cube root, you're going to cube. I'll never give you anything higher than squaring because the arithmetic gets very messy. Okay. Foiling is, or double distributive is already going to be bad enough. So we'll just stick with that. Okay, we do have to check for extraneous solutions. Okay, so the, the algebraic approach, I think that's what I'm going to focus on. You could probably figure out the graphical approach. There's many ways to do it. Graph the left side in Y1, graph the right side in Y2, calculate an intersect, you're done. If you don't want to do an intersect, subtract one, bring it to the other side, and then you could calculate roots. Okay, so that's no different than what we've done before, but the algebra is. So let's, let's go through the algebra. So the first thing it says is to isolate a radical on one side. We don't have a radical isolated right now. We have two radicals together on the same side. I've got to move one of them to the other side. I'm going to move this one. So 4x plus 9. It's going to cancel it out from there. And then I just get 6x plus 12. Square root of that equals 1 plus square root 4x plus 9. Now it says raise each side of the equation to the power of the index. What kind of root is by itself on the left now? <coughs> About the same? Square root. square root. So what we're going to do is we're going to square and square. OK, the left side, that's the easy part. Square root and square cancel out. So 6x plus 12. On the right side, that's FOIL. You can't just square the 1 and square the root. You have to think of it as this. And you're multiplying if you want to think of it that way. It's 1 plus square root 4x plus 9, all squared. Okay, and now we'll distribute it up. So we get 1 times 1, and that's not bad. We're going to get... 1 times square root 4x plus 9, and 1 times square root 4x plus 9. How many square roots of 4x plus 9 do we have? Okay. Two of them. Two square roots of 4x plus 9. Okay, and the last part is square root 4x plus 9 times square root 4x plus 9. What happens when you multiply two roots together and the radicands are identical? Like if you did square root of 7 times square root of 7. What happens to the root? Yeah, the root just cancels out and the answer you get is what's underneath. So we're just going to get 4x plus 9. And now we have to do the same thing one more time. Get that root by itself. Okay, what I'm going to do is uh, combine my like terms. So I have 2 root 4x plus 9. I have a positive 1 and a positive 9. That'll give me plus 10. Let's bring, let's bring everything that's not a root to the left. So subtract 4x. Subtract 4x. Subtract 10. Subtract 10. Um, I'll deal with the 2 after. 6x minus 4x gives me 2x. And then 12 minus 10 two. It gives me a 2. And that's equal to 2 square root 4x plus 9. And how would I get the 2 on the right over to the left? Yeah. Divide everything by 2. 
which actually works out very nice here. So I get x plus 1 equals the square root of 4x plus 9. So now we're getting a relatively simple equation. Isolate the radical and then raise each, power, each side to the second power. Now at this point, our roots are gone. The right side is 4x plus 9. The left side is going to be x squared plus 2x plus 1. I'm going to put everything, um, let's get everything on the left. So we got x squared minus 2x minus 9 from each side. 1 minus 9 is negative 8. What kind of equation is that? Yeah, that's just a quadratic and it factors. Factors into x minus 4, x plus 2. If it didn't, I'd use the quadratic formula. Okay, so we get 4 and negative 2. Is there anything I have to do to, with those two answers? Yeah, I've got to make sure that I'm never going to plug one in and end up doing something I'm not allowed to do. Okay, let's, um, let's check negative 2. Okay, if we plug in negative 2, what's 6 times negative 2? Negative 12 plus 12 is 0. So we get square root of 0. And that's minus, let's check negative 2 here. What's 4 times negative 2? That's negative 8 plus 9. 1. So minus the square root of 1. Let's check that. The square root of 0 is how much? What's the square root of 1? 1. What's 0 take away 1? Negative 1. Negative 1. We were supposed to get positive 1. So what that means is negative 2 doesn't work. If you check 4, it works perfect. If you plug it in, do the arithmetic, it works out. You end up with 24 plus 12, that's 36, which is, square root of 36 is 6. If you plug in 4 there, you get 16 plus 9 is 25, square root of 25 is 5, 6 minus 5 is 1. Okay, so that's all you need to check. This would be the same type of problem, except instead of two roots, there's only one, and instead of squaring, you're cubing. Graphically, we can, we'll talk more about that problem tomorrow. Okay, but if you understand how to solve other kinds of problems graphically, these are the same type. So on 255, I'd like you to try 1, 3, 5, 6, 12 to 14, 20 to 22, 28, 31, and 35.